Working for Mrs. Carter in the White House was really the greatest honor of my life. She's a wonderful, wonderful person who was an amazing boss. She never asked us to work any harder than she worked herself. Oftentimes she worked harder than we did. She cared about issues that addressed the needs of people around this country. I think each First Lady brings to the office her own particular interests, her own special relationship with her husband, and her own aspirations about what she wants to do with the role. How they choose to use the influence that comes with that title, I think, remains a very individual and particular um, set of decisions. I think the First Lady's role started out primarily as a social role, uh, being a ceremonial partner to the President and the hostess for the nation. I think as the roles of women have changed, the roles of the First Ladies have also changed, become much more highly politicized, much more involved in uh, social reform causes, and that that has become sort of an acceptable part of being the First Lady. Um, so that you have this uh, visibility and legitimacy and clout uh, within the nation to promote the kinds of reforms and uh, social programs that you think will be helpful. Women today, and of course Jim was president a, a long time ago, um, but women have such opportunities today and you realize that a First Lady, as I said before, can have some influence. So the White House is a great bully pulpit from which to work on issues that you are interested in. The First Ladies is the traveling version of the exhibition on First Ladies at the National Museum of American History. We have a very large uh, political collection that includes presidential, White House, and First Lady materials. We are really excited about having the First Lady's exhibition here at the Carter Center. It's a great exhibit. And walking through it was really interesting to me. It took me back to our days in the White House and to some of the First Ladies that I had read about and studied about and the things they are doing and the impact they made on the country. start out, of course, with Martha Washington, who established the role as the social partner and ceremonial partner of the president, followed by Abigail Adams, who then established the role as political partner to the president. So the first ladies who follow can either follow one example or the other, or combine them and extend and redefine. One of the things that's very interesting is that the role of the first lady has changed as the role of women in the country has changed. And so Martha Washington uh, was an excellent hostess for her husband. She knew that was a very important part of her role. And so she established the role of the First Lady as the ceremonial and social partner mm -hmm. of the President. And then Abigail- But she didn't like it. No, she didn't like it. <laughs> it, was a great, it was a great strain on her. Mm -hmm. But she knew that it made uh, an advantage for her husband's career and um, you know, pushed his career forward. So, um, and they never lived in Washington. And they lived yeah. in New York and Philadelphia, so this was before the White House. And this uh, is the wooden tea tray. You this is the wooden tea it. tray that mm -hmm. you mentioned, yes. Mm -hmm. And the Washington China was actually purchased from a retiring French diplomat. So it's not new China. Mm -hmm. They, they uh, bought secondhand China, which was perfectly acceptable in that time. Okay. I was fascinated with the China in the White House. Oh, I, th I think the China is one of the most exciting parts of, of the whole uh, social scene at the White House. 
And Abigail Adams had a very a different kind of dynamic in her marriage because uh, she and John had come together because they both enjoyed uh, politics. And so she was outspoken about her own politics, mm -hmm. uh, so much so that his opponents called her Madam President, <laughs> <laughs> which was not a term of endearment. So anyway, at the beginning of our history, we have these two women who interpret their roles very differently, mm -hmm. but they establish these two important roles as social partner and political partner right at the beginning. And then first ladies who follow them can choose to emphasize one or the other. And I read that um, Abigail Adams didn't think it was polite to have her picture made without a Without her bonnet. Without on. her bonnet, that's <laughs> correct. So. Yes, that you weren't fully dressed unless right. you had your head uh, headgear on. Mm -hmm. I think what will surprise people about the exhibition is how a number of the earlier First Ladies were politicized. I think people um, tend to think that that's more post Eleanor Roosevelt, and yet uh, when you look at a number of these women, they were very involved in their husbands' political careers, uh, particularly Abigail Adams and Sarah Polk. So I, I think people will be surprised how early some of these roles of the First Lady began to develop. And this section deals with women who have been political partners to their husbands. We talked about, uh, about uh, Abigail sort of establishing that mm -hmm. role, but Sarah Polk in the 1840s was also a political partner to her husband. And um, we thought that we could symbolize the fact that she wrote a lot of his speeches and edited the one she didn't write mm -hmm. by displaying her writing oh, desk, which yeah, is great. Um, a beautiful wood with all kinds of inlay in it. And um, she was known for lobbying in the Congress for her husband's programs. Oh, was she? And his opponents, uh, one of them said that he hoped that if, if she were in the White House, she would take up housekeeping like a normal woman. <laughs> And she said, uh, if James and I are elected, mm -hmm. I will neither keep house nor make butter. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I edited Jimmy's speeches sometimes. Did and you? I still now, today, oh, I edit what he writes and he edits what I write. And the best thing about that is having him do it. Two is, minds working on the... Yeah, but the best thing is you don't have to take his edits if I don't want to. That's right. <laughs> I'm thankful that... She went, and I'm thankful for the results of her trip, and also thankful that they are home safely. Thank you very much. Jim and I have always been partners, and it started, I think, uh, after he, we came home from the Navy. And uh, he worked in our farm supply business, and he asked me one day to come down and, and help him he, uh, because he wanted to go out and visit the farmers. And, I started keeping books. Pretty soon I knew more on paper about our business than he did. And I think at, at that point, uh, we developed a mutual respect for what each other knew and could do. So when he became a politician, got into politics, running for office, I campaigned for him. Uh, I learned the issues. When I got to the White House, my husband had already been governor. And I had worked on a lot of issues, mainly mental health. and. I realized that a First Lady has some influence, and so I was eager to start working on mental health issues again and, and programs, and I really saw my role as trying to help people in need have a better life. We call for a new federal grant program for community mental health services, improved mental health coverage in Medicare and Medicaid. I also think that her role in the White House was very consistent with her role in the earlier part of her life with Jimmy Carter. From the time that, that they were married, they were really partners, and they each had carved out areas of sort of responsibility and focus. And certainly when she became First Lady of Georgia, she took on a number of issues as First Lady 
that we're all geared to addressing the needs of the most vulnerable people in our population. So I think that what she did in the White House was really building upon interests and efforts that she had undertaken earlier in her life. Mrs. Carter was unique in not seeking to camouflage her influence, not seeking to camouflage how politically involved she was, and for sort of pioneering the idea of the importance of mental health. I think that was a very taboo subject, sort of like AIDS was when, uh, when that was, was first acknowledged as a, as a major uh, health problem. So I think she took the stigma out of mental health difficulties by making it a national program. And I intend to be active in monitoring and drawing attention to the progress and the results of the recommendations. Every person in this room should be proud of this report. I am, and you will be too. I think one of the things that it's important to remember is that up until the Carter administration, first ladies had been covered on what we used to call the women's pages or the style section. So the press and the American public really were accustomed to seeing their first ladies portrayed in fairly traditional roles as helpmates and as hostesses in the White House. Many of Mrs. Carter's projects didn't fit on the society pages of the newspapers. So I think there was a disconnect between the expectations of the society reporters or the reporters who wrote for the women's pages and where Mrs. Carter was focusing much of her attention. One White House reporter told me one day that mental health is, not, is just not a sexy issue. And so they didn't cover it like I wanted them to. And also, when I had interviews, I would have interviews about, do you miss cooking? Um, one said, uh, wouldn't you rather be flitting around Europe now? And who made this outfit? Well, I, fi I, I just finally got to where I liked my clothes. They were very special to me. Um, but I didn't want to focus on them, and so I always tried to change the subject. And I got to where when somebody said, what is, who made the suit you're wearing? I just said, I don't know. <laughs> Most of the times I did, but, but I just did not want to focus on clothes. I did sit in on cabinet meetings when Jimmy was president. And um, I didn't start it until February of the second year we were in Washington. But um, I was so frustrated with why decisions were made, and I would, and and I realized that you can't really tell by the news what's happening. And every day he would get off of the elevator in the second floor, our, our living quarters, and I would say, "Why did you do this? Why did you do?" This? And one day he said, "Why don't you come to cabinet meetings, and then you'll know why we make these decisions." So I went every every time I could go. It was good for me because I had been across the country telling people what we we're going to do in the campaign and I wanted to know uh, what we were doing and why we were doing it and I also answered questions about issues when I traveled when he was pres president so it was, it was um, I, thought, I thought I needed to know what was going on. I have worked on immunization issues um, for a very long time since my husband was governor. And um, I worked with Betty Bumpus, whose husband was later Senator Dale Bump Bumpus, but he was governor at the same time my husband was governor. And Betty got me involved in working on immunization issues. What we realized, when Jimmy was elected president, only 15 states required immunizations by school age. And so working with Betty, we were able to get immunization in all 50 states, thinking we had childhood immunizations under control. And she and Mrs. Bumpers are still traveling around the country, working to bring attention to the importance of making sure that all kids have their immunizations before two. So I think certainly there are many different ways in which a First Lady can exercise influence. And I think Mrs. Carter was always keenly aware of making sure that she didn't cross boundaries of exercising her influence inappropriately, but in issues such as childhood immunization, which 
needs to be a priority in this country. I think she was quite comfortable just highlighting that issue and bringing it to the president's attention. Dolly Madison was a very successful hostess. She was the one who first blended the role of political partner with social hostess um, and helped promote her husband's career that way, helped promote his um, political agenda. And yet she was very, very popular. He was um, a scholar and um, a very quiet person. Dolly was very uh, outgoing and very engaged with people. So I think she became a good spokesperson for her husband under the guise of entertaining. And I think people will be um, surprised at that. I think she's known for her entertaining, but not for the political component. Well, I would say that both Dolly Madison, for an earlier example, and Jacqueline Kennedy really just had an appeal to the public, whether it is personality, personal style, uh, both of them being younger than some of the other first ladies. They just had an energy about them and people were drawn to them and just wanted to be with them. Um, and I don't think you can separate uh, that personal energy and enthusiasm completely from their roles. So we talk about the public image of a variety of first ladies and how they went about uh, fashioning themselves to not only f promulgate the image that they wanted, but to fit the temper of the times. Mm -hmm. And so uh, with women going back to the home after working in the 40s during mm -hmm. the war, then you get these two uh, post-war first ladies who image themselves as an everyday housewife. Mm -hmm. Although I dare say neither Bess no, Truman so. nor, <laughs> nor Mamie Eisenhower was an average no, housewife. No. And I think First Ladies have had more influence on oh, I think they presidents than, than people know about. I <laughs> quite agree. I quite agree. I wanted you also to notice uh, Jacqueline Kennedy's miniskirt mm -hmm. outfit uh, that was designed by Oleg Cassini. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. It is lovely. Mm -hmm. But that was kind of a shock for a First Lady <laughs> to wear a mini dress in the mm -hmm. White House. but. Um, I think she got away with it because she had such a fashionable image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, people thought anything she wore was, was beautiful. Was exactly. beautiful and the right thing to wear. Exactly. <laughs> In the case of Jackie Kennedy, I think we can see that this is a first lady who just absolutely captures the spirit of her time in the White House. The 60s is a time when fashion, uh, which used to be very much top down, um, elite fashion setting the style sort of trickling down to the rest of us, uh, that fashion uh, model really inverts and street style uh, and youth culture really are kind of going up the, uh, if you want to say, food chain of fashion. So it's interesting um, as a young first lady in the office with young children that she brings a youthful uh, style to her role. She is so much known for um, the little A-line dresses, suits with three-quarter length sleeves, and of course the pillbox hat, that I don't think any of us can even really think about her without um, kind of dressing her that way in our minds. One of the early first ladies who was a kind of media star was Frances Cleveland. She was mm -hmm. 21 years old when she married Grover Cleveland, the president, in the White House. Mm -hmm. And uh, people were quite shocked at the time mm -hmm. at the disparity in their ages, 21 and almost 50. Mm -hmm. But um, she was very young, very beautiful, very gracious, so she won everyone over. Mm -hmm. And then became a kind of a pop star. Because she was so popular, mm -hmm. um, they co-opted her face to advertise products. Oh, really? <laughs> so this is the Merrick Thread Company. And the thread is in the form oh, of a what, heart yeah, that says... And this is Mrs. President Cleveland. Mrs. President Cleveland, yes. I've been called Mrs. President. <laughs> and this section focuses on First Ladies after the White House uh, once they have that visibility, mm -hmm. popularity, acclaim, uh, legitimacy, 
to continue to do good work for the nation in some kind of social cause or, in your case, mental health, mm -hmm. uh, habitat for humanity, the immunizations and Well, we have the Carter Medical. Center has programs in 35 African countries. We have them in 65 countries, the poorest, most isolated in the world, in 35 Africa. And more than half of our budget is on health programs. And this was given to me in Nigeria when we went to a guinea worm village where people had this horrible disease that we are, have almost eradicated. eradicated. Oh, mm -hmm. that's wonderful. I like this. It's a sweet object. It's a beautiful object that's handmade, you know, and it was, it's uh, intense work doing this kind of beading. So I love the object, but I also really like, you know, what it signifies. And, you know, I work on the exhibitions and I learn a lot about the exhibitions, you know, by working on them. I'm not a curator, I'm not a content person, but this piece really stands out to me because I think about Mrs. Carter getting up to her elbows in this guinea worm eradication program, and I, I think it's brave, you know, and it's, it's not even in the United States. It's not like it's a big PR thing for her, or, you know, it's just a truly humanitarian uh, effort on their behalf, and it, this piece really stands out to me because of that. I think much of the work that Mrs. Carter does today and that the Carter Center does today um, which gets very, very positive coverage, is essentially the same kind of work that we were doing 30 years ago. We were looking for ways to improve the lives of people who were struggling with various kinds of conditions, whether it was poverty or discrimination or age or mental health. Certainly her legacy is that she was very much her own person in the White House and that she pursued those projects and those issues that were important to her and important to her husband. So I think that legacy of being her own person was important because it occurred at a time when, as I mentioned earlier, the role of women was really evolving and so I think it, it established in a public way the opportunity for a first lady to really select her own priorities and be her own person. I think the First Lady has a very difficult job because it's undefined. The founders certainly didn't write any job description for a First Lady. And so these women have taken the roles of women at any particular time and adapted them to their husband's political agenda and also to their own temperament so that each First Lady pretty much writes her own job description and contributes to the country in the way that she feels she can make the best contribution. It's a role that probably will always be somewhat ambiguous and so from my perspective the important point is that the first lady or hopefully one day the first man has the opportunity to really define the role in a way that fits his or her particular interests and expertise. Understanding that it's not an elected role, but it is a role that comes with huge influence. So from my perspective, what Mrs. Carter did extraordinarily well was seize the influence of the office and use that to do good. Well, Jimmy said I was the political one in the family. So I was always concerned about the politics. Um, and, and I felt like I had to be because Jimmy is not a politician at all. But it was, it was um, a great opportunity for me. and. Um, a, a wonderful experience to be First Lady.